All right, guys, the day that we have been preparing for all year is almost here. It is almost time for the Science Super Bowl, uh, where you will show all of your science knowledge that you have acquired through cool labs and experiments and activities, um, videos and songs. You're going to show all of that on your Science EOG. So, in order to help us do that, we're going to have a brain dump. Um, again, don't let, it be, don't let it stress you out. Uh, let it really be a tool that's going to help you to keep all of your thoughts organized because we have learned a lot this year. If you can't remember some of the parts, it is okay. Uh, what you can remember will be helpful. What you can't remember, it will totally be fine. All right, so when you get your scotch paper on your EOG, it's gonna look just like this. There's not gonna be anything on it. You're gonna take that scratch paper and you're gonna fold it in half, and then you're gonna fold it in half one more time to make four equal quadrants. And with those equal quadrants, you are going to trace your creases. And this video is also gonna be used for review because I will quickly be reviewing everything, most of the things that we have covered this year. The highlights. All right, so we're gonna trace the quadrants on both sides and we're gonna write a positive message to ourselves. You got this. And my pen just got ink everywhere. Oh well. All right. We're gonna list our units in the order in which we learned them this year. So. First, we learn force and motion. It was followed by matter. Then heat transfer. Heat transfer is really neat. It always goes from hot to cold. We're gonna go ahead and write that so that we don't forget that. And then we spent a lot of time on weather. And before we move from weather, we're gonna write weather moves from west to east because of the jet stream and the prevailing westerlies. And we're gonna draw us a cool little picture of the jet stream to help us remember what it looks like. It's a tunnel of air that separates the cold air mass from the warm air mass. And again, weather is caused by uneven heating. All right, on the back side to the next units that we have covered. After weather, we learned about ecosystems and the different biomes that are in the world. Living organisms. And then we finished up the year with genetics, which you guys did phenomenal on. Um, but basically genetics is um, that traits can be inherited or they can be acquired or learned. And if traits are inherited, we are born with them or we got them from our parents. If we have to acquire or learn traits, we obviously were not born with them and we did not get them from our parents. Something in our life happened to us that caused us to have certain traits or we learned them ourselves. So we went ahead and got that one out of the way because it is the easiest. All right, for force and motion, a force is a push or pull. And we know that forces can be balanced or unbalanced. And a balanced force looks like a friendly game of tug of war where the sides are equal. If they're pulling with the same force, they're the same size, they have the same strength, there's going to be no motion. 
because the forces are balanced. Now, if the forces are unbalanced, that's kind of like a three-on-one game of tug-of-war, which really is not very fair. This poor guy is outnumbered, and we know that the force is going to move in the direction, or sorry, the object will move in the direction of the greater force. So there is motion when we have unbalanced forces. Also, we have a fourth statement. Friction opposes force or motion. Um, it helps to slow things and stop things, okay? And then last but not least, we've got our distance time graphs. Constant speed looks like something traveling at a constant increase. Uh, constant speed. If something is accelerating, it starts really slow and the line gets steeper and steeper, which causes it to curve. And then lastly, we've got no motion. So when you've got that flat line, that means that nothing is happening. Time is passing, but the distance is staying the same. One unit down, six to go. Just kidding, we've got two down. All right, matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed. And it can be changed in one of two ways. It can be changed physically, so it can undergo a physical change or it can undergo a chemical change. Physical and chemical. Physical changes can usually be reversed. Um, it can consist of a solid turning to a liquid and a liquid turning to a gas and a gas turning to a liquid, and a liquid turning to a solid, however many times. A change of size or shape. And then dissolving or mixing something. Kind of like when we're thinking of Kool-Aid or lemonade. Uh, you can taste the lemons, you can taste the sugar, you can taste the water, um, but they're all mixed together. It doesn't change the the flavor or the color or the the odor everything maintains its original properties however with a chemical change chemical changes cannot be reversed and that is because a new substance is formed that is a key term if you don't write anything else on your brain dump and you've got to write matter you want to know that Physical changes can be reversed, solid liquid gas. Chemical changes cannot be reversed, and a new substance is created. Um, but some examples of those would be rusting, burning, cooking. Um, if something produces gas bubbles um, or a color, odor, or temperature change. Um, change. All right, that's matter. Moving on to heat transfer is really neat. It always goes from hot to cold. So, for example, if we're talking about a, a spoon and a hot cup of coffee, which of those would be hot? The coffee, of course. And the spoon would be the cold object until it gets in the coffee. So the heat's gonna transfer from the coffee to the spoon, but then we've gotta analyze it a step further. That coffee is a liquid, but the spoon is a solid. Um, and since the spoon is a solid and it's touching its inside of that coffee, it's gonna be our first type of heat transfer, which is conduction, which is heat transfer through direct contact or touch. Heat transfer through direct touch. Solids are 
touching. And it doesn't have to be two solids, but one solid is usually involved there. Um, and we think of maybe a frying pan, cooking some food on the stove. The pan is touching the stove and conducting that heat. The next type of heat transfer is convection, and that's heat being transferred in a current in liquids and gases. So it warms liquids and gas in a current. Lastly, we've got radiation. That is heat transferred through rays, waves, um, usually the source of heat would be the sun or a fire or on the same terms as, my, as, as waves, we might think of a microwave. So all of those are key terms. It's going to let us know that radiation is happening. Now, heat's going to transfer freely unless it is slowed or stopped by an insulator. Okay, so in, insulators do not allow heat to pass easily. Okay, so when we think of insulators, we're going to think rubber, plastic, paper, etc. All right, weather, your must-have for your brain dumped is the barometer. Ms. Hernandez's favorite weather tool because it helps us to predict the weather. It is the most reliable. Uh, 29.5 goes in the middle. It measures the weight of the air. And on the left side, that's our low pressure side. So low pressure brings light air, which is lousy weather. And we know that that lousy weather looks like a rain cloud. So we're gonna go ahead and draw a rain cloud. And on the right side, the high side, high pressure is heavy air. and it brings happy weather. And happy weather looks like a super smiley sunshine. Okay, or we sometimes see fair weather. I'm gonna add your little dotted lines there, and you're gonna continue listing your lousy weather symbols and, or signs and your happy weather. Uh, lousy weather looks like a cumulonimbus cloud which we know causes those thunderstorms. Okay, so we'll draw some lightning, some raindrops, and then stratus clouds also cause light, steady rain. And um, cold fronts usually cause those cumulonimbus clouds. And remember that there's cold air. There's a cold air mass that follows behind that cold front. So after the storms pass through, the temperatures will drop. And then with the stratus clouds, stratus clouds are usually formed along a warm front. And again, the warm front is the front of a warm air mass. So after the, the long period of steady rain, the temperatures will increase a bit at, if, after a warm front goes through. Our local weather patterns look like a sea breeze, which is when the wind blows from the sea. We'll draw us a little sea there. A little ocean. We'll pretend that's the ocean. So during the day, the wind blows from the sea to the land at the beach. And at night, it flip-flops. At night, the wind blows from the land to the sea, and you've got a land breeze. One of the things that impacts our weather on a regular basis is the Gulf Stream, and we know that the Gulf Stream is a warm ocean current off the coast of North Carolina. Because it is a warm ocean current, it warms up 
all of the land and the air on the coast of North Carolina making our temperatures more mild than usual. And that is very predictable. It's always there. It hasn't gone anywhere. However, out in the Pacific Ocean, we have these things called weather phenomenons. They happen every five to seven years. And every five to seven years, we might see an El Nino or a La Nina. El Nino is Spanish for the boy. And we have learned that El Nino brings warmer Pacific Ocean temperatures, which brings wetter weather that moves from the west to the east. So as that warmer Pacific Ocean evaporates, it brings more moisture across the United States. But again, it's only every five to seven years. And then the opposite of El Nino, because science is full of opposites, is La Nina. And that is when the Pacific Ocean is colder than usual. And it brings dry weather. Because the Pacific Ocean is cold, it's not evaporating, and it's not able to um, move across the United States, bringing us more weather. And we are almost done already. That was super fast. So next was ecosystems. We learned that abiotic is not living. It's never lived. It's, it will never live because it has never had life. However, if something is biotic, it is living, even if it's dead, because it still has energy and nutrients to give back to the earth. We learned that we have two different types of ecosystems. We've got terrestrial ecosystems, which are our land ecosystems, and we have aquatic ecosystems, which are our water ecosystems. Within the terrestrial ecosystems, we have a dotted line that goes across the middle of the earth, and that is our equator. That is the warmest point on earth. And at the equator, we usually see our warmer um, biomes, which would be our rainforest and our desert. One is super wet, one is super hot and dry, um, but they're there at the warmest part of the earth. Um, grasslands and deciduous forest are kind of spread about uh, to the north and the south of the equator, uh, but we only, uh, we put grasslands to the bottom and deciduous forests to the top, uh, just so we can have some room to add some notes about the deciduous forest, because this one's special to us because we live here. This is our home. And not only is it our home, we know that here in the United States, we have four seasons. That is a characteristic that the deciduous forest has. Um, a little slightly colder than the deciduous forest. It usually has lots of Christmas tree and moose uh, scattered about is the taiga. So it's snowy a lot of the times, but not all of the time. But the most northern ecosystem is the tundra, and it stays frozen, and it's covered in a layer of permafrost, um, which is very specific for that ecosystem. The aquatic ecosystems, we draw a little Venn diagram to help us to remember the differences between our fresh and our saltwater ecosystems. So our freshwater and our saltwater ecosystems, salt is the ocean. Freshwaters are our lakes, ponds, streams, river, etc. And then in the middle, this is a mixture of the two, okay? So where the two mix, we have what we call the estuary as well as the marsh. That's where fresh and salt water mix. The last thing we're gonna add here for ecosystems is that all the energy for the ecosystems comes from the sun. And the sun gives its energy to producers. Producers make their own energy using the sunlight and they are plants, pa pa pa, -pa plants, pa, pa pa producers. And then those plants give their energy to uh, consumers that eat them. So a consumer that might eat a plant might be a rabbit. And we call those herbivores. 
And then a consumer that might eat a rabbit would be referred to as a carnivore because they are a meat eater. They're eating another animal. And an example of that in this ecosystem may be a fox. All right, but we also wanna look. These are both consumers. They both have to consume something else in order to get their energy. But the producer produces. It makes its own energy using energy from the sun. Without producers, this energy stays up in the sun and these guys die out. All right, last one, living organisms. C-T-O-O-S, C-T-O-O-S, cell tissue organ organ system c t o o s so that is to the tune of hot cross buns if you guys have not learned that yes yet in a uh, music on your recorder hopefully one day you will probably when you get to band in middle school um but a group of cells make up a tissue Group of tissues make up organs, groups of organs make up organ systems, and groups of those organ systems make up organisms, which are humans, uh, animals, um, that's horrible animals, sorry about that, um, a dog duck, I don't know, um, a butterfly, a tree, all of these are examples of organisms, maybe even uh, an amoeba. That's a unicellular organism. We'll add a little nucleus in there. So these are organisms. Um, so our organisms can be unicellular or they can be multicellular. Um, both unicellular and multicellular organisms are capable of performing all seven life functions, but the unicellular is special because it only needs one cell to perform all life functions. It is the ultimate independent organism. Um, some examples of those unicellular organisms are amoeba, which we just drew right up there. We have yeast, bacteria, euglena, paramecium. Those are all unicellular organisms. Multicellular organisms are made up of many specialized cells. And examples of Multicellular organisms are things like us, people, animals, plants, and insects. Those are all good examples of multicellular organisms. And then the last thing we're going to do today is talk about our six uh, body systems. We're going to start with the skeletal system. The skeletal system's function is to provide, um, to protect our internal organs to provide structure, support, and it's made up of bones. All right, um, working very closely with the skeletal system is the muscular system. The muscular system helps those bones to move. Okay, so the muscular system is responsible for movement and it's made up of muscles. Next, we have the digestive system. And the digestive system is, uh, it breaks down food into nutrients. Those are all key words to let us know that digestion is happening. It breaks down food into nutrients. Um, and we know digestion takes place in the stomach and the small intestines. I think that's the one that we are like an expert on. So we're going to keep rolling. The nervous system. The nervous system, its function is to send electrical messages throughout the body. 
and it is made up of the most important parts that we need to remember is your brain, spinal cord, and it's in the name, but your nerves. And two more. We have the respiratory system, and it is responsible for exchanging gases, and it uses the lungs to be able to exchange those gases, that oxygen for the carbon dioxide. And then last but not least, we have the circulatory or the cardiovascular system. Remember, we've got to know both names for that, circulatory or cardiovascular, and it's our transport system. It transports oxygen, and nutrients using the heart and blood. All right, guys, we wrote it in the beginning, but I got it here at the end. You've got this. You guys have been uh, engaged in our science lessons throughout the whole year, and I know that tomorrow when we take our EOGs, you are going to ace the test, and it's going to be awesome, and we're going to all be able to celebrate and uh, have a great time. Um, so get a good night's rest. Don't forget to wear your D.A.R.E. shirt tomorrow, and I'll see you bright and early. Love you. Mean it.